that the wind um, is through you somehow. That you have created uh, this world, you have created this ground that we stand on. We recognize that we are part of your creation and that you have enabled us to sing to you. That you have enabled us to recognize that you are here and that you've saved us. Lord, may we hear your word to us this morning and may it uh, be planted in our souls in a way that gives us life. We offer you our time right now and our attention. We offer you our gifts, our tithes and our offerings and our abilities, the things that we can give. We pray that you will continue to do uh, good work through us in our community. That you will continue to use your people to bring healing where there is brokenness in the world. May we hear you, Lord, for that end. Amen. All right, my young friends, Rachel, do you have any instructions? Okay, pick the tables across by the park. Have a great time. That's actually a beautiful sight, just watching them run. Oh my goodness. Fun. Well, Stonehouse and friends, uh, we have been spending time in the book of James for the past several weeks. Um, this book is like towards the end of the New Testament, and we have seen firsthand that this guy did not get around the bush, uh, meaning he says it like it is. He's teaching us who we are, and as God's people, and what we're meant to look like, uh, who we're meant to be. And he's calling us out on our you-know-what, our incongruence, the ways our lives don't line up with God's ways. Um, we're going to see that again today on Church Picnic Sunday. Um, as I plotted out this series, I saw that today's text was going to be on Church Picnic Sunday, and I was literally like, okay, really? What are the chances? This is the worst one. <laughs> like, this has the highest potential to offend. <laughs> and it's not very church picnic y. But as I'm like obeying, right? As I'm like walking this out, it's just like, okay, well, here we go. So here's a moment of truth for you. There are certain weeks where the selected text, and I mean, yeah, I'm making the schedule, but we're just following along in the book, right? So where the selected text intimidates me more than others, um, this was one of those. Uh, this is a holy task, this studying God's word and interpreting it for us. That's part of my job, right? I want us every time to honor the text, the Bible, by reading it well, hearing what God has to say to us through it, which means preaching all of it. Not skipping just because it intimidates me or because it maybe will cause some discomfort. Um, even the prickly parts. And here's the gift of that, friends. As I give myself to this task, to studying on our behalf, to interpreting on our behalf, um, as I give myself to this task to kind of stay true to that call, I see how the text is situated in the whole thing, and suddenly what feels prickly on its own becomes the kindness of God. And that's exactly what happens happened this week. That's exactly what happens every time. So it's not as prickly as I thought. <laughs> so let me reintroduce you to James very quickly. Uh, this book 
is actually a letter. Um, it was likely written 15 to 20 years after Jesus returned to the Father, which was just 40 days after he was raised from the dead. This makes this letter one of the earliest writings in the New Testament. And it is addressed to believers who were scattered throughout the known world. James calls it the dispersion. They were scattered because persecution had arisen in Jerusalem after the stoning of Stephen, who was a believer. And some believers left because of this, and other believers chose to stay in Jerusalem despite the persecution, and this includes James. And that's the context that gives rise to this letter. And it is brilliantly written, friends. It is practical, and it is wisdom-filled, and it guided the early church, and it continues to guide the church today, which is us. Although he doesn't introduce himself this way, it is believed that the James who wrote this letter was the brother of Jesus. At least that's what tradition tells us. Um, as far back as Josephus, who was a historian who literally lived from 37 to 100, Jesus died probably around 33 AD. This Josephus lived right after that, and, and he connects James, the brother of Jesus, to this letter. This means Jesus and James grew up in the same house. And although we don't know this story, we do know that at some point after Jesus returned to the Father, James became a leader of the church in Jerusalem. He was a pastor. And his letter reads that way, a brother writing to his fellow sisters and brothers in Christ about how to show up in the world um, as those who are followers of Jesus. His words actually echo things that his brother taught. And the way it reads, it's almost like he had a copy of Jesus' words, maybe even Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, sitting on the desk in front of him as he wrote his letter. He keeps bringing up the same things that Jesus said. So today, I'm going to remind you of a few things that James has been saying to us so far. Then we're going to look at the next part of his letter, which leads us to take a good look inward and acknowledge what's going on. Then we'll hear James tell us what God wants for us and why. And then he's going to tell us what it takes to get there. And then I'll tell you a story at the end that will tie it all together. Nothing we hear today is coming out of left field. James has either said something like it already or the scriptures James was building something as he wrote. You know how somebody does that in a book, or, or maybe they're building an argument uh, to support something, right? He's building something in this letter, and I think today we actually get the main point of his whole letter, the central call. Now, you can't read James without recognizing that this faith we hold to is meant to directly affect the way we live. He talks about the importance of not just hearing the word, but doing it. Of our faith and our deeds being inseparable. Meaning what we say and what we think and we do actually prove whether our faith is living or whether it's dead. This is what he talks about. Near the beginning of his letter, he tells us God's word has been planted in us. And he connects this word to what he calls the perfect law which is the same law that Jesus talked about in the Gospels. The one that can be summed up as like, love God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. James calls this law um, the law of freedom. Remember how we talked about that? About how actually this law that, that he's calling us to, to love God and to love our neighbor, is actually something that brings freedom to us. And he says that this law, this word that has been planted in you, actually saves your souls if you can receive it. It can make you whole. It can heal you. But we have to do it. And so far, James has been showing us how. You want wisdom? you got to ask God for it. Don't blame God for the temptations you Recognize you're being tempted by your own desires and that you're responsible and accountable for your own actions. He 
tells us, get rid of the filth in your life and receive God's word with humility, like good soil. This one's familiar. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Don't show favoritism. Don't privilege one person or group over another. Everyone is equally valuable because everyone is made in God's image. So treat everyone with dignity and respect. Control your tongue. That was a tough one. <laughs> Recognize how powerful your words are. Love God and your neighbor by what you say. Last week, through Dave, we heard James ask a question. He's like, who is wise and understanding among you? And he goes on to describe this wisdom from above, God's wisdom, and he compares it to worldly wisdom, showing how they're in opposition to each other. Worldly wisdom is characterized by bitter envy and selfish ambition and disorder and every evil practice. Godly wisdom is pure and peaceable, and gentle, and open to reason, and full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. I'm just quoting James here. In other words, wisdom from above is characterized by humility. This is what James has been saying so far. And now today he asks a second question. He's getting us to, again, take a good look at ourselves. He's like, what causes quarrels and fights among you? So if you look at that, he is, again, talking about how we use our tongues. It just keeps coming up. Before we go on, I just want us to take a minute and think about what causes quarrels and fights among you. It might be easiest to think in the context of our families or even our marriages or um, our kind of closer relations. Uh, we don't deal with much conflict at Stonehouse right now, thank goodness. Um, but we do deal with conflict, right? Okay, please raise your hand if you have conflict in your home sometimes. Okay, it's not just us, okay. 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 <laughs> it might be, uh, so, okay, so what does cause quarrels and fights in our families? How about not getting what we want? How about competing agendas and values and priorities? How about disagreeing about what's most important? How about our expectations not getting met? Oh, man. Oh. Sounds right, right? Okay. We quarrel and fight because we tend to think that our priorities should be the highest ones and that our way is the best way. And like, let's just think about that for, for a second. Think about two paths. If this is one way and this is the other way, like you can't have two best ways going in two different directions. And yet we're meant to like be functioning as a unit. So like, how does that work? I'm going to read from James 4, starting in verse 1. Um, if you're going to follow along in your Bibles, I invite you to turn there right now. James is like, what causes quarrels and fights among you? Is it not this, that your desire, your passions are at war within you? You desire and don't have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have, because you do not ask, you ask. Because, and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your desires. You adulterous people, James says, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity, which means like hostility with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world or makes themselves of the world makes themselves an enemy of God. Not very church picnic -y, guys. <laughs> Oh. And then he says this, Or do you suppose that it's in vain that the scriptures say the spirit that he made to dwell in us during his jealousy? 
I'll get to, I'll explain that in a minute. James is using really strong language here to make his point. He's capturing our attention. He's not the only one to have done this in scripture. Uh, this is what the prophet did. And I think James is imitating them here. He's naming the sin, adultery, that Israel and Judah repeated over and over. And it's like he's saying, this is what we do. Israel and Judah were unfaithful to God. Um, that is the story that is told in the Old Testament many times. Uh, they kept breaking the covenant, the promise that they made to God, to be loyal to God and faithfully live out his ways, which was loving their neighbors. Um, they failed over and over to love God with their whole hearts and to love their neighbors as themselves. They got wrapped up in themselves, as we humans do. And God yearned jealously. This is how he talks through the prophets. God yearned jealously for their unwavering devotion. This is what God does. Jesus also used strong language to make his point sometimes, um, like in his Sermon on the Mount. Remember that part where he likens anger to murder? Um, it's a tad uncomfortable. Uh, he also tells us to gouge out our eyes if they cause us to sin. Strong language is used to get a point across. Um, and James is doing that too here. He's been calling his uh, readers brothers and sisters this whole time, and now suddenly he's calling us, you adulterous people. He really wants us to see what we do, what our tendencies are. James echoes Jesus' sermon here, I think. The part where Jesus talks about prayer. Uh, this is from Matthew 5. Um, Jesus says, ask and you will receive, seek and you'll find. And James says, you ask, but you don't receive because you're asking with wrong motives. In other words, you're not focused on God's kingdom and God's will like Jesus told you to be. You're focused on yourselves. I think this is what he's pointing to here, our tendency to be self-centered, to focus on getting what we want, what we need. And James calls this friendship with the world. That's what the world tells us to do. He's, it, this is kind of like what he's saying. Um, the world tells us, focus on getting what you want. And then he says, if that's our focus, we're actually standing in opposition to God and God's ways. In other words, you can't be loyal to both. You can't give your loyalty to God and to the world. They oppose one another. So I was thinking about this, like, think about two magnets when they are, when the, is it the positive or the negative, whatever side it is, they're facing each other and they actually pull away from each other. They push away. You cannot get them together. That's what, that's the picture that we're being given here. Loyalty to God and loyalty to the world, it doesn't work. Okay, so can we all agree? Yes. This is the way it is. We trend toward self-centeredness. We trend toward arrogant, thinking our way is the best way and our needs are the most important. We do know where this comes from. It's rooted in fear, really. It's rooted in that innate desire to control outcomes because we need security, we want security and stability. That's what we're reaching for. Um, we react to things to protect ourselves. We try to control outcomes so that we get what we want, what we need. But in the process of doing that, what do we do? We step on others. We push our way through. And that's what James is calling out here. Uh, we're not slow to anger. We do show favoritism. We don't control our tongues. We do have selfish ambition in our hearts, and we quarrel and we fight. 
And you know what? The world says, that's just fine. Pursue your own comfort. Get what you want. And James says that as we do that, our loyalty to God and God's way sort of just evaporates. That's the sense we get. And suddenly we're standing in opposition to God. Now, I don't think that this is where any of us want to be standing. I don't want to be. I find myself there, but I don't want to be. And God doesn't want that for us either. God wants our whole hearts. He wants us to love him um, and to practice his ways, which means loving our neighbors, others, as we love ourselves. And this is actually, we talk about this all the time here, this is what's good for us and for the whole world. God yearns for our attention and our devotion. He wants us to be near him, just like a good parent wants their children to be near them. It's for our good. So he gives more grace, James says. Um, He doesn't let us stay stuck in the space where we're standing in opposition to him. And that's the good news. That's the, the part that like helps us not to be so prickly. So I'll read a little bit about that here. He gives more grace. Therefore it says, and he's talking about the scriptures, God opposes, opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. You wonder what this means. God opposes the proud. What does that mean? Think about that magnet again. Um, somehow, humility, so this is the this is the, the opposing, is like God doesn't let that be, right? Instead, with humility, he gives grace to the humble. Um, as we admit our sin, as we ask for help, as we turn to God, when we turned away from him, um, this is where we find God's grace and where we can receive it, and that's the coming together of the man. Then James tells us how to get there, uh, to this place of humility, which is directly connected to wisdom and to doing what is good for that last week. And so this is the kind of practical aspects of this. He says, submit yourselves, therefore, Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter turn to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. He will lift you up. This is a call to repent. This is a call to recognize and own that we mess up, that this is what we do. We are double-minded. We have these disordered affections, we can call them, and we fail to love one another and to love God with our whole hearts. This call from James is a call to resist the temptations the devil throws at us. Just like Jesus did in the wilderness. That's the picture I think we have to think of uh, when we hear him say that. This is a call to draw near to God. And in the drawing near, to wash our hands and purify our hearts. Um, this wretched, being wretched and mourning and weeping, uh, these are the things that the prophets call for. He's echoing them um, as he says that. He's using more strong language. Um, these things that he's calling for are signs of repentance, of turning back to God. Again, um, we're being called to humility, to come to God acknowledging our weaknesses and our need for forgiveness and help in this. Uh, the, the picture that came to me was that lost son parable. Um, so think about that for a minute. The son leaves, right? He, he goes his own way and he leaves his father. And eventually he wakes up, he recognizes, wait a minute, like, because some bad things happen to him while he's away. Uh, he ends up being super hungry and he's like, wait a minute, 
I could go home and, and I could be at my father's house. I could be his servant even. And I would have enough to eat. And, and his coming back to his father is that picture of repentance that we're being given here. And what does the father do in that story that Jesus tells? The father welcomes him with open arms. That's the picture that we're given. As we kind of enter into that humbleness, that humility, and come to God. When we do this, James says, God will lift us up when we humble ourselves before him. When we come to him admitting I messed up. I want to do better. I need your forgiveness. I need your help. And in that moment, God lifts us up. He honors us. That's the idea. So James has just showed us kind of what humility looks like before God. And now, he shows us what it looks like on the ground in our everyday lives. And he gives one super practical example. And it, again, has to do with our tongues. So this is coming from verse 11. He says, Don't speak evil against one another, brothers and sisters. The one who speaks evil against a brother or sister judges his brother or sister. Oh, judges the law. Um, the one who speaks evil against a brother or sister judges his brother or sister speaks evil against the law and judges the law. The law that he's talking about is that kind of law that Jesus talks about, right? Love your neighbor. He says, there's only one lawgiver and judge, the one who's able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge your neighbor? Not judging our neighbor a practical way of living out this humility that we're being called to. Not speaking against our brother or sister, uh, but leaving judgment to God. I, I don't know about you, but I trend toward judgment. Probably that's my besetting sin, actually. <laughs> like, I can kind of keep it to myself, maybe. Not always, but I, I move into that space so easily. And I also experience it from others. I experience being judged by others. Um, you probably do too. I was trying to think of a story that would illustrate what James is talking about in this part of his letter, like this calling us out on our tendency to be self-centered and to judge, and this call to humility before God and with our fellow humans. Um, and the one that came to me is actually found in Matthew and Mark, um, and Luke has something a bit similar. So I'm just going to um, tell it, but I'm going to look it up here. Uh, it's the story, we, we looked at this when we were in Luke, actually, um, where the two brothers, like Jesus, some of his closest disciples, James and John, come to Jesus and they're like, hey, we want the best when it comes to the kingdom. Um, so yeah, so in this story, in Matthew's version, it's actually the guy's mom that comes to Jesus, but you know that the guys are there with him, or with her. Um, so she comes up, and she kneels before Jesus, and she asks him for something, we're told, and he's like, what do you want? And she says, so can you just promise me that these two sons of mine, um, are going to sit on your right hand and on your left hand um, in your kingdom. And Jesus says to her, you don't know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup that I am able to drink? And he's talking about his suffering. And they, they say to him, because they're standing right there, yeah, we can do that. And he says to them, um, okay, yeah, you will actually drink this cup. Um, but to sit at my right hand or my left is not actually mine to grant. It's for those for whom it's been prepared by my father. So it's like God actually decides um, who's going to be there uh, in my kingdom. And then the ten other disciples hear about this conversation, we're told, and they're indignant. 
um, a corpse, right? They're probably standing in judgment in that moment. Um, but also these other guys are standing in judgment in the sense of like, we're the best, like we should actually have these seeds. And Jesus calls them to him. And he's like, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. So he's talking about the world. Let's put that in quotation marks. He says, their great ones exercise authority over them. And then he says this, not so among you. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be the first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man, he's talking about himself, came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Not so with you, he says. This is not the way that my disciples are meant to be in the world, where you're first, where you're the most important. You're actually a servant. Friends, this is a choice that we make, and this is a hard choice that we make every day about how we think about ourselves in the world, whether we're putting ourselves first or not. Thank God there is grace for us when we fail at this. We need that grace. Jesus reorients his disciples in that story, and James is doing the same thing here. And this call to humility, to not putting ourselves at the center, but actually serving one another, honoring one another by what we do, by, by compromise, right? That's what it means to love our neighbor, to not judge one another. This is what it means to love our neighbor. And then, of course, um, this beautiful promise is right at the center of this uh, section. He's like, uh, submit yourselves to God. And how does he say it? Um, submit yourselves to God and what's the promise attached to it? Oh, there is a Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. This is the promise attached. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. That's a cool promise. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. I think that's the most beautiful and central thing that we can walk away with today. It's like, as we step into humility, as we come to God, owning our stuff, and asking for help, God draws near. Let's pray, and then we'll call the kids back for the communion. God, thank you for your word. We thank you for how it challenges us, how it calls us out, for how you enter us through your word, Lord, in order to shape us, in order to make us more whole, in order to help us as we navigate our relationships with one another. May we be humble, Lord. May we come to you asking for help and asking for forgiveness, turning back to you when we've turned away. And would you please help us to love one another, to not put ourselves at the center. We need your help with this Holy Spirit. And we submit ourselves to you and your Go with us from here uh, into the rest of our week. May these words continue to uh, speak to our hearts and our minds. Amen. All right.